All right, gonna state a few theorems, gonna learn how to find inverses, gonna make a few comments about inverses. If we have time, we'll do 2.3. There is no homework on that, so if we do or if we don't, it won't really increase your load this week. Let me state a theorem. A is, this is really an if and only if, but it looks like I just have it as follows in the notes. If A is invertible, The equation AX equals B always has a unique solution and in particular The solution is x equals a inverse times b. I mean, this is basically like college algebra or, or pre-college algebra. I mean, if you had not matrices but numbers and you had an equation ax equals b, it would have the unique solution, x equals 1 divided by a times b. And with inverses playing the role of division, that's precisely what we have here. Uh, um, but of course, it's more significant with matrices because, I mean, it's easy to write matrix equations that don't have solutions or don't have or have infinitely many solutions. So here we're saying that as long as the inverse exists, there is a solution and there's one solution. There's a unique solution. A few more theorems, just kind of generic working with inverse type stuff. If A is invertible, so is A inverse. And in particular, the inverse of an inverse, two inverses undo each other. The inverse of the inverse is the original matrix. And again, this is really like out, you know, college algebra, high school algebra, really pre-algebra um, being taken to this, you know, new environment. If you had a real number A, the inverse is 1 over A, and the inverse of the inverse is 1 over 1 over A, which is indeed equal to A. So in this sense, inverses act the way you would expect them to act. Here's a kind of interesting theorem. Theorem. If A and B are invertible, and A and B are the same size, so we can talk about the product. 
then the product of invertible matrices are invertible. And the formula is maybe not exactly what you'd expect. The inverse of a product is the product of the inverses. But in reverse order. And because the last two frames were really just college algebra stated in a slightly different environment, I didn't bother to provide any proof. Here the proof is just, well, if this is true, remember that matrices are inverses if multiplying them together gives the identity matrix. If this is a true statement, then that product ought to be the identity matrix. And here's you know, associativity. Again, it's something maybe you don't think about just because you're so used to thinking about, to using it that it's sort of instinctual at this point, but it's a really powerful property. It's what lets us move the parentheses around. And now that those inner matrices B times B inverse are the identity matrix R. I is the one of matrix multiplication. That is to say that multiplying by I doesn't do anything and we can just not bother to write it. And then A and A inverse together also make I. So these are inverses because their product is the identity matrix. We're now going to go on what is going to seem like a detour, but is it? We'll see uh, how this material relates to matrices shortly how this material relates to inverses shortly. So now I want to define an elementary matrix. An elementary tree matrix is the identity matrix I with one elementary row operation performed on it. And I mean, as a pedagogical side note, theorems like this are why we make you do Gauss-Jordan elimination by hand at the beginning of the class. Because I mean, even if that's a skill, that you're going to start using your calculator and then not do it again, but like row operations will continue to come up. And the, you know, the question of what this algorithm is doing will continue to come up. So it is important to understand it and not think of it as a black box algorithm that is happening on your calculator. But um, that, as I say, is a side note. So we take an identity matrix, perform a single row operation on it, and we get an elementary matrix. 
track. So, for example, if we have the three by three identity matrix, we could swap the first and the third row. And swapping rows is an elementary row operation. So this matrix I have written on the right is an elementary matrix. And although you would never actually do this while you're performing Gauss-Jordan elimination, you can think of elementary row operations in terms of multiplication by elementary matrices. So this elementary matrix came about by swapping the first and the third row of the identity matrix. Let's see what happens. If we take this elementary matrix and we use it in matrix multiplication, and because we know order matters with matrix multiplication, we're specifically going to multiply on the left. And let's just have a completely arbitrary A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, okay, well, if we do this multiplication, first row, first column. Here are the, the wonders of the whiteboard is that I can do stuff like that and then just erase the scribbles. So first row, first column. 0 times A, 0 times D, 1 times G. First row, second column, 0 times B, 0 times E, 1 times H. First row, third column, 0 times C, 0 times F, 1 times I. And we can keep repeating, I mean, we can do the multiplication, or at least I, I hope we can, and we end up with this. And in particular, this matrix we wind up with is the original matrix with the first and the third rows swapped, which is exactly the row operation we perform to create that elementary matrix. So stating this as a theorem, Left multiplication by an elementary matrix. performs the row operation that created the elementary matrix tricks. 
So this sedimentary matrix was created by swapping the first and third rows. Left multiplication by it swaps the first and the third rows. So the implication of this is that even though you wouldn't do this in practice, you can think of Gauss-Jordan elimination as a bunch of matrix multiplication. You start with your matrix and you left multiply to perform your first row operation and you left multiply to perform the second row operation and you keep performing row operations until you've got the matrix in reduced row echelon form. For now, state a theorem involving inverses again. So back to inverses. A is invertible if and only if performing Gauss Jordan elimination on A turns it into the identity matrix. And this theorem continues the same row operations that turn A into I turn I into a inverse. So going back to this picture, let's think of Gauss-Jordan elimination like this, left multiplication by a bunch of elementary matrices. A is invertible, if the end of this process is the identity matrix, if putting A into reduced row echelon form gives you the identity. And what I'm now saying is that if we take the identity and we perform the same row operations on it that we performed on A, the identity will turn into a inverse. So let's say one, two, three. Let's ask if this is invertible, and let's find the inverse as it is, if it is. Well, if it's invertible, then Gauss-Jordan elimination ought to turn this into the identity matrix, and I'm going to go a little quick, but tell me if you think I'm making a mistake. We multiply the first row by negative three and add it to the second row. Four. 
for reduced row echelon form. We need that second row to be um, to have one as its leading entry. So we'll divide it by negative two. And then we'll multiply the second row by negative two and add it to the first row. And we do indeed get the identity. find the inverse, and we'll see a way to do this on our calculator, but for this illustrative purposes, to find the inverse. Well, the first thing we did here was take the first row, multiply it by negative three. What did I do that? Four, undo, undo. We took the first row, we uh, multiplied it by negative three, and we <coughs> added it to the second row. So here, if we take the first row and multiply it by negative three and add it to the second row, here's what we get. Then we took that second row and we multiplied it by negative one half. So we take the second row of this and multiply it by negative one half. And we're seeing the seeing the issues with finding inverses by hand, which is that these matrices usually get uglier and uglier as you perform these steps. Finally, we took the second row, we multiplied it by negative two, and we added it to the first row. So, um, God. So negative one half times negative two is positive one. Plus zero is one. Then three halves times negative two is negative six halves plus one. One is two halves. So I make that negative four halves or negative two. And we can, on this moment of tension, where we check our work, but one, two, three, four. I'm going to have things to say about finding inverses on the calculator, but for now I'll just do it. Uh, matrix edit, two by two, one, two, three, four. Our calculator has, let's see, I mean if you press this negative one button, negative two, one, 1.5, negative 0.5. Is that negative 2, 1, 1.5, negative 0.5? That is indeed what I got. Um, why is this work? Well, we'll give the proof. or at least part of the proof. Suppose that A is invertible. So what we now want to show is that if we hit A with Gauss-Jordan elimination, it's going to turn into the identity matrix. And this is pretty, uh, 
pretty easy, actually, although it's one of those things where, I mean, of course, it's easy once somebody's told you how to do it. A theorem from earlier in this class is that if A is invertible, this has a unique solution. Um, the uniqueness of solution says that every column <coughs> of A has a pivot. For that matter, the existence of solutions tells you that every row of A has a pivot. So if you imagine, say, a three by three matrix, where are the pivots? Well, the pivots have to go from left to right. Um, because the pivots are the, the leading entries when we're in row echelon form. And the leading entries in row echelon form go from left to right. So, I mean, if the pivot in the first row were here, the pivot in the second row would have to be there, and then there would be no space for a pivot in the third row. The, the only way to fit a pivot into every row and column is if the pivots are down the diagonal. And then you just remind yourself of what reduced row echelon form is. All of the pivot positions are one. So these numbers down the diagonal have to be one. Being in row echelon four means that all of the numbers below a pivot are zero. Being in reduced row echelon form says that all the numbers above a pivot are zero. So once you've seen that the pivots have to be down the diagonal, you're basically done. The pivots have to be one, so it's ones down the diagonal. Everything else is zero. And this is the identity matrix. So, suppose that A is row equivalent to i, which is just a fancy way of saying when you hit a with this Gauss-Jordan elimination algorithm, it gets transformed into i. Then, thinking of Gauss-Jordan elimination as multiplication by elementary matrices. Uh, I've just realized, no, no, I was going to say my notes had left, let me down, but it's in my notes, I just didn't see it. Um, I'm going, for this moment, I'm going to just say something so that the proof can go through. And I'll give a justification for what I'm going to say in a moment. But for now, I'm just going to say, and we can accept, that elementary matrices are all invertible. So what we can do associativity lets us uh, think of those elementary matrices as a single product 
if we gave this a name, then multiplying both, well, let's go through this uh, slower. Say we gave this a name, say we called it W. Now, if we multiply both sides of this equation on the left by the inverse of W, this did go on the whiteboard. How do I know that W has an inverse? Well, because the product of invertible matrices is invertible. So if I multiply both sides by the inverse of W, this turns into I, multiplying by I doesn't do anything, we can just ignore that, and we get that A equals W inverse times I. W inverse, what is the inverse of this thing? Well, I've said that the inverse of a product is the product of the inverses, but in reverse order. So A equals E1 inverse, E2 inverse, up to E P inverse times I. And now I'm going to use the fact that um let's see. E1 inverse, E, sorry, I'm uh, spacing a little. Multiplying by I doesn't do anything, let's ignore it. Okay, so great, got it, sorry, I was just spacing out. A is invertible. I know that A is invertible because each of the beats elementary matrices is invertible. And we have a theorem that says the product of, of invertible matrices is invertible. So we've written A as the product of invertible matrices. A inverse certainly exists. And in particular, A inverse equals the inverse of all of this. Uh, is this is this clear to everything? If two matrices are equal, they have to have the same inverse. So I'm using the fact that A equals this to say that A inverse equals this inverse. Now that tells us in turn So we once again have the inverse of a product. And once again, we know what the inverse of a product is. It's the product of the inverses in opposite order. So E P inverse, inverse. E P minus one inverse inverse down to E one inverse inverse. 
the, this is the product of the inverses in the reverse order. And now I've said this earlier today that an inverse of an inverse is just the original matrices. All of these inverses cancel out, and I get that A inverse is this product. Because multiplying by I doesn't do anything, I can put an I there if I want. And now I'm saying, because remember, multiplying on the left, by elementary matrices performs row operations. I'm saying that to get A inverse, I should start with the identity matrix, and I should perform a bunch of row operations on it. And these row operations I'm performing are the same row operations I perform to turn A into I. Okay, we got there in the end. Um, I, I forgot to put it on the board, so I said just believe this for a moment and we'll justify it later, that every elementary matrix has an inverse. Um, that's because every row operation can be undone. If you swap two rows, you can swap them back. If you multiply a row by five, you can multiply the same row by one-fifth. The third elementary row operation, multiplying a row by a scalar and adding it to a third row, you can multiply the row by the negative scalar and add it to the other row, and that will undo itself. And um, the inverse of an elementary matrix is the elementary matrix that undoes the row operation. So like swapping the first and third row gives you a matrix. Um, well, that's a bad example. Multiplying the first row by five gives you an elementary matrix. Multiplying the first row by one-fifth gives you an elementary matrix. Those elementary matrices are the same. They're e um, no, what am I doing today? Sorry, those elementary matrices are inverses of each other because the row operations undo each other. Heck, I have no idea why I thought it would be a good idea to deliver that verbally. Um, if E is an elementary row up elementary matrix. Um, it is invertible. In particular, the row operation that created E can be undone with another row operation that creates E inverse there. Just needed to get it written down. 
more than anything else. And then this example I keep doing You can take an elementary matrix and you can multiply the first, you can take the identity matrix and you can multiply the first row by five. And because you're performing a row operation on an identity matrix, this is um, an elementary matrix. What am I doing? A race. So let's call this elementary matrix. Well, you can take the identity matrix, and you can multiply the first row by one-fifth, and this creates an elementary matrix. And these row operations undo each other. If you multiply by five and then you multiply by one fifth, those will cancel out and it's the same as doing nothing. And that's E inverse. Okay. Oof. Um, so how would you like do this on our on your calculator. Um, this has always seemed it's always seemed a little weird to me. I mean, there's a very specific level that textbooks want to use technology, sort of traditionally. And that level is often kind of arbitrary. So, on the one sense, if we've decided to use our calculator, well, we've seen there's just a little button we press. So, you find inverses on your calculator by pressing the little button. But that's not a level of technology that most textbooks want to want to acknowledge. So instead, we get the following. In order to find an inverse, you take the matrix you're interested in, and you augment it not with a vector, but with the entire identity matrix. And then you perform Gauss-Jordan elimination and assuming that A is invertible, you'll wind up with the identity matrix augmented with A inverse. And I've described this as something you do on your calculator. And I mean, it doesn't have to be, but this is just sort of acknowledging the reality that if A is like bigger than maybe four by four, five by five, it's going to be an absolute mess trying to do this by hand. In fact, even if A is relatively small, it's going to be a mess doing this by hand because we've sort of seen this. But when we start doing these row operations, sort of these ugly fractions immediately creep in. So, in practice, this is something you would do on a calculator. 
Let me put a pin in that statement that we would find in verses on our calculator. And let's just do an example. One, two, seven, zero, three, negative four, six, two, one. So I said uh, last Thursday that if you create a matrix at random, it's almost certainly going to be invertible. So I'm sort of uh, relying on that. I created this matrix at random, but I think it's going to have an inverse because basically all matrices do. Okay, so here, let me get this in the share. Here's A. I'm going to augment it with the identity matrix. So I need another three columns. And now the identity matrix is one, one, one. So here's A augmented with the identity matrix. Perform reduced row echelon form, Gauss-Jordan elimination, perform it on A. Okay, and this matrix is invertible. You see we have the identity matrix here. And this stuff to the right of the identity matrix, these horrifying looking decimals, this is the inverse matrix. It might look slightly less awful if we converted all of those to fractions. I mean, it's still not lovely. Our common denominator was 163. But there's a inverse and also a fine illustration of why I said this sort of has to be done on the calculator. Having said that, I always feel like we're sort of, this section feels like we're jerking our students around a little because the next comment I'm going to make is that you should Basically, never find an inverse. This algorithm that I've shown you is an algorithm you should not be using. And the reason you should not be using it is that this algorithm I've shown you is slow, but it's also what we call numerically unstable. So our brief, very brief lecture on numerical linear algebra. Um, 
your cultivator and any computer algebra system is going to be storing fractions as decimals. Like, one third is probably being stored as something like point three 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 which is very close to one third but not exactly one third so if you take a matrix that looks like this, say, and you store it in your calculator. The instant that goes into your calculator, you have introduced error into the problem. You have not introduced a lot of error into the problem because your calculator is probably keeping either 8 or 16 decimal places, but on either the ninth decimal place or the 17th decimal place, there is. Your, the number in your calculator is not the number we have written on the whiteboard. Now, with, um, with most algorithms that we're going to work with, and for most of the stuff we're going to do on our calculator, that tiny error in the 17th decimal place is just going to sit there. It's not going to fix itself. It's not going to get any worse. You just do your work with your calculator, and you have this tiny rounding error, and it's fine. It's so small that if you go to the math menu and ask your calculator to turn 0.333, all of those threes into a fraction, your calculator will be able to deduce that you probably want this to be a third. The inverse algorithm takes these tiny errors and it makes them worse with every step. So that by the time it's found the inverse, that insignificant rounding error has the potential to be quite significant. And I mean, if you know these two by two matrices, three by three matrices, that's probably not going to be an issue. Like the example I showed you, I have little doubt that the inverse the matrix, that the inverse your calculator found really is the inverse. But the bigger the matrix is, the more steps that have to be performed to find the inverse, and the more these errors propagate. So when you get realistically sized matrices, you know, 50 rows, 50 columns, or whatever, you cannot really trust your calculator's output. So, and I mean, I'm, I'm framing this as a problem, you know, with this algorithm, but there aren't any better algorithms. It's not like there's an alternative you could use. And this might be surprising because, um, because we're really just performing Gauss-Jordan elimination. So how can the inverse finding algorithm be bad if Gauss-Jordan elimination works fine? And I mean, the answer to that is that um, for Gauss-Jordan elimination to be fine, to be stable, your calculator is doing some stuff behind the scenes that we don't do when we're performing it by hand. 
like it's moving rows around to make sure that the greatest entry is in the top row and stuff like that. And your calculator, I guess I didn't have it written down, but when your calculator is performing, Gauss-Jordan elimination on that identity matrix, it can't do any of the stuff that would make it a stable process. Like, it can't move rows around because, well, because the rows that get moved around are determined entirely by this matrix here. Um, so we're really not interested in finding inverses. Um, and as I say, it sort of feels maybe a little weird, like we go through this process and then we waggle our finger at you and say not to do it. And I mean, I don't think I mean, I, I follow the textbook. It would probably be pretty weird to have a linear algebra course where you don't teach students to find inverses, but I don't think it would be inappropriate necessarily. But this isn't the same as saying that we don't care about inverses. We don't want to do this one specific thing. We don't want to find inverses, but we're very interested in knowing whether a matrix has an inverse, whether a matrix is singular or non-singular. And that's because there are about a dozen properties that a matrix can have that are logically equivalent to being non-singular. So if you know that an inverse exists, you know a lot about the matrix. And let me... So this is the next section. I've uh, get into... Where am I? What am I? This is courses 337. I'm just going to go to the modules and show you rather than trying to put all of this on the board. We're in 2.3, the invertible matrix theorem. Let me share this. Lots of videos, but only one uh, short set of notes. And the invertible matrix theorem, as I say, it's a list. It says that there are 12 properties that are logically equivalent to each other. And I've never this is pedagogically difficult. I mean, it's hard to tell a student just commit this giant list to memory, but most of these, I mean, you could maybe get away with ignoring 10 and 11. Those are one-sided inverses, they don't get discussed in this course. And you could maybe get away with ignoring 12 because transposes aren't really talked about in this course. But otherwise, the following are equivalent. And I know it might, I, I don't know how to, if there's a way to zoom in, there is a way to zoom in, but I still don't know how readable this will be from the back seats. But I mean, a lot of these are like, A is invertible is equivalent to A being row equivalent to the identity matrix. 
physics. Well, that's a theorem we stated today. Both of these facts are logically equivalent to the statement that A has n pivot positions. This is all logically equivalent to the statement that AX equals zero has only the trivial solutions, which is logically equivalent to the columns of A being linearly independent, which is logically equivalent to the linear transformation T of X equals AX being one to one. Maybe you could get away with not worrying about six so much. We won't be doing a lot with linear transformations, at least not for a while. But all of this is equivalent to the matrix equation AX equals B, having at least one solution for every B. Um which is equivalent to the columns of A spanning Rn, which is equivalent to the matrix to the linear transformation <coughs> T of X equal was AX being one to one. And I mean, the stuff here that's important will probably just kind of filter in as we go throughout the course. I mean, I, I talked about memorizing this list, but I don't really know how much sense that would make, especially, I mean, this is only like a partial statement of the invertible matrix theorem. You can expand it to probably 20 equivalencies or more. So, I mean, what's probably going to happen is that these equivalencies will eventually just kind of, as I say, filter their way into your subconscious as we keep hammering this material. I probably would not, I mean, I, I, I never did. If, if you gave me a pop quiz and asked me to state the invertible matrix theorem, I'd probably get five or six of these. I certainly wouldn't get all 12. But I just wanted to show it to you because, I mean, after, you know, sort of, I feel pulling the rug under your feet a bit, I want to now say, well, we don't want to find inverses, but we do want to know whether a matrix has an inverse. Because if a matrix has an inverse, that gives you a whole bunch of stuff. And very slightly early, but that's it for today. There's a uh, there's no homework on the invertible matrix theorem. There is a homework on um, inverses. Is that up? That is up. So obviously, I think you should focus on uh, studying for third.